Your Money with Michelle, only on Money FM 89.3. Read with your money, only on Money FM 89.3. We're live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook. Just check out Money FM's official channel. It's a very special edition of Read. I'm speaking to one of the world's greatest novelists. Now, all three of his books have the distinct honor of being nominated for the Booker Prize. Tan Tuan Eng's latest novel, The House of Doors, is a beautiful, powerful, compelling work of historical fiction set in his hometown of Penang of 1921. It has made the top 13 books singled out for the UK's most prestigious literary award. You're listening to Read with me, Michelle Martin, and today I am thrilled to welcome author Tan Tuan Eng, who joins us live. Good morning. Good morning, Michelle. Great to speak to you again. <laughs> It blows my mind to have the great honor of speaking to you again. It was just a week ago we were at Kinukunia, yes. surrounded by listeners and viewers. Now, among the many questions on my mind, this is your third nomination. Your first book was long-listed, your second short-listed. What does making it to the top 13 books in contention from a strong field of 163 novels, what does this mean to you? Well, it means that uh, the, the world's media attention uh, will be focused on these 13 books. So it's extremely helpful uh, in terms of uh, reaching a broader audience than uh, before, because you know, thousands of books are published in, in the UK every year and to, and most of them disappear without a trace because of the, the lack of media interest in it. So suddenly to have this intense focus on on these 13 books uh, is very good, but also quite frightening as well. You start hearing what people are saying about the books, whether they like or hate it as well. So, Yeah. And how do you respond to reviews, negative or positive? I mean, do you seek them out? Do they just come at you? I think inevitably you'll be exposed to reviews because we 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 spend so much time online. Uh, you you can't avoid comments or, or uh, discussions and all that. So the thing is to to have a really hard shell and just don't let these things affect you because you know the book is out there. It's in the public domain and. Uh, readers do feel a sense of possession or ownership once they have the book in their hands. So they feel that they're allowed to express their opinions, uh, positive or negative. So it's, it's part of the job. So you, you just have to de deal with it. <laughs> part of the job. Part now, you've the given job. the world, you've given us incredible pleasure with all three of your books, Gift of Rain, The Garden of Evening Mist, The House of Doors. You've said in previous interviews that you think of your books as part of a series. Uh, does House of Doors relate to the other two in any way? Well, The House of Doors has uh, uh, two characters from The Gift of Rain making a sort of a cameo appearance towards the end of the novel. Uh, in, in many ways, it's a sort of a, a farewell to um, um, Penang to Malaysia as well, because I have a feeling that this is this will probably be one of the, the last book that I will set in Malaysia and Malaya for quite some time. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in writing about other places in other times as well. So it's time to let go uh, and, and think of other other things to and places to write about. So this is sort of my Malayan trilogy in, in a way. Ah, the Malayan trilogy. So when you say you're gonna be looking away from the region, does that mean Singapore is out of contention in any of your books? Well, we, we don't know. Uh, it, it's, the interesting thing is I, I never know what, what, what story is going to strike me and then I'll start exploring and researching. Uh, it, I'll still be interested in Asia and Asian history because I find that very fascinating and there's so many stories still left to be told. Um, but I'd love to explore outside Malaysia and outside Southeast Asia as well and to see what, what's out there. So interesting. Now, when we were chatting at Kinokunia here in Singapore just about a week ago, there was a young lady who asked you why you seem to focus on older characters. I suppose everybody wants to read some aspects of their lives in the books that they read. Uh, when you write, do you think at all of what your audience wants? Not really. I think I have to respect the expectations that the writing will be of a particular standard. That that's first of all my 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 benchmark is what the writing has to be uh, of that quality. Otherwise, I'd be embarrassed by the final product, the final book. That's what I'm most concerned with. That I I'm not embarrassed by my books. Uh, Ten years from now, when I see them and say, "Oh, this that's horrible writing," and how could I have published that? Uh, that that's that's my greatest fear. That I don't that that I walk into a bookshop and then I cringe when I when I see my books. So that, that's the main concern, that the writing has to be of uh, good 
very high quality more than more than anything else and i think readers respond to that when they when they can sense that the the, the writing is of sufficient quality and that i put a lot of work into ensuring that they can trust me uh, or the writer that i am not going to let them down you know that i respect their expectations yeah and every line is beautiful it's like burnished gold gorgeous to enjoy and savor um i watched an interview that you did maybe you know, over a decade ago, when you say, you know, you put everything into that first book, everything that you care about, you put in there, all your turns of phrases that are important to you, make it into that first book. And you were anticipating it being more difficult to write follow ups. This is your third book. Has it been more difficult? It has. It has. This was this was the worst. The third book was the worst. Second book was very hard. This was the third. And this one is the worst. And so I really dread uh, book number four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> um, it just gets harder. You know, it's so hard. It, it's not an easy job to do and to come up with uh, striking and original sentences that make readers go, oh, ah, this is this is very nice. This is very good. And this is memorable. It, it takes a lot out of me. Uh, and uh, I find it uh, quite exhausting most of the time. <laughs> It's really interesting to hear about the labor that it takes to to create this, these works of art. What does it take to distill the spirit of a particular time? You take us back in this book to 1921 Penang. And when you're decanting and distilling the spirit of that era, how do you do it? What What is important to you? What <clears throat> everything the, the five senses that's why my books are very descriptive with I use all the five senses to try and immerse the reader in in the era and in the characters and society as well so to do that first I have to myself I myself have to get into a, a semi trance myself you know, sort of time traveling uh, in, in a way mentally and I normally start by listening to music um, usually movie soundtracks very sad music no 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 singing no britney spears or, or, or madonna <laughs> so, <that's that. laughs> so it's it's very evocative moody atmospheric soundtracks normally hans zimmer or max richter things like, and i play it in a loop that same piece it goes in a loop again and again for pro probably the, the entire duration while i'm writing the book i always put it on so now when, when, whenever I hear the same piece of music again now, I'm instantly uh, uh, hurtled back into the, the awful time of trying to make the book work. <laughs> so it's not happy memories most of the time. It's quite like, oh, ouch, yes. <laughs> so you are literally immersing yourself in a vibe as you create the vibe for yes. listeners. Yeah, I think that's the only way to, to, to translate and transmit that vibe onto the page. Otherwise, that feeling cannot be conveyed onto the page if i don't feel it how am i going to convey it because i am not good at faking it at the moment i hope to be good enough later on to fake that <laughs> at the moment it still has to be uh, very authentic uh, what i feel <laughs> did you come to writing late in life in your book in your 30s and is in your 30s i understand right 27 i think no it's probably gift of rain was published 2007 so i was 35 at but I started writing that a few years before. So, yes, I came late to it uh, after a few years as an intellectual property lawyer in KL. And I felt that the years as a lawyer helped tremendously in my uh, growth as a writer because it forced me to be, be concise and, uh, and to understand the nuances of language, how important language and words are. As, as a lawyer, every word, has, has, every word is loaded. You know, they can be misinterpreted so many ways. So you, when you're drafting something, you have to see all the ramifications of this particular word. What does it mean for this person, that person, and how it's going to detonate back in your face? You have to be so careful about that. And that training has been extremely helpful uh, as a writer because you're suddenly aware about the various uh, uh, nuances of every single word, and you have to pay attention to that. What has being a writer allowed you to do in life, which you couldn't as an intellectual property lawyer? It's allowed me to go through my working day without the, 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 the constant fear that there's some irate and angry client is going to ring me up you know, without warning and ruin your whole day. You're there working in the office and suddenly there's this phone call and this client is totally upset about something and is screaming at you. And I always lived in dread of that every day when I go into the office. I'm just thinking, okay, who is going to ruin my day today while I'm working here? And being a writer doesn't. You, you're in your own bubble. 
you're creating your own work. There are no phone calls and you just work, which is, is, is a, a huge privilege and a blessing uh, for me. Uh, I, I can't deal with, with these sort of uh, uh, angry phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> and luckily you don't. Now you just deal with phone calls of friends saying, now you've now, nominated. Now, yeah. <laughs> now I'm the one making angry phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> oh I'm, the one, I'm the one ruining people's days. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're really making our day. If you've just joined us live on Money FM 89.3, I am thrilled as a, a reader, a member of many, many book clubs to be speaking with the Tan Tuan Eng, who has been nominated for the Booker 2023 for his book, The House of Doors. Many book clubs are tuning in, uh, Tuan Eng. Do you want to say anything to them? Yes, uh, to all the book clubs in Singapore and Southeast Asia and around the world, thank you. Thank you for reading The House of Doors and all my other novels as well. I hope you enjoy them and that the, the books generate a lot of uh, heated discussions amongst yourselves, whether, whether you like it or hated it. As long as the discussion, it creates this, this greater uh, interest and excitement about books in general. And that's the wonderful thing about, about book clubs. You know, there's this constant argument going on there, which is great. Yeah. Constant argument. Love that. You said to the crowd gathered in Singapore at Kinukunia, where you made an appearance recently, that when writing House of Doors, you were solving a puzzle that you had set yourself. Can you help us understand a little, a little bit more about how you work? Do you need to know where you're going before you write? Have you got it all planned out on some whiteboard? What were the early strands of that puzzle? Uh, okay. Well, the early strands were uh, the characters of Sanderson and uh, Somerset Maugham. I had those two characters in mind. I wanted to write about them and put them in my book. I also knew how the story would end. I had this idea for a woman who is somehow connected to these two uh, people. I actually had the final sentence already, the last sentence in the book. I don't know why, but I had that uh, uh, on the other side of the world, on an island on the other side of the world, it is already morning. So the whole entire process of writing The House of Doors was, uh, it's like an arrow you shoot and it has to hit this target, which is the final sentence. So that was the entire, I didn't know how to get there. I had no idea. I, did, I don't plot. I can't plot. I can't think of a, a you know, step by step. So it's very, uh, it's feeling in the dark, <laughs> fumbling around. But I knew that that light at the end, that that sentence glowing, shining at me. So I was aiming for that. Uh, and that was very difficult, uh, just incredibly hard. <laughs> but yeah. I love that line. I didn't want to let it go. I just love that final line. Uh, it's, it's so uplifting, despite all that's happened in the story. It comes at the end where there's suddenly, you know, this shining glow coming from on an island on the other side of the world. Yeah, what a beautiful beacon to aim yes. towards in the writing yes. of this book. Yeah. You know, I spoke with Hanya Yanagihara, uh, author of A Little Life, once, and she shared how even after she was done writing, the characters still lived with her. She could still hear them. What is it like for you with your characters? Are you done with them the moment you finish the book? I, I'm done with them, but because I've been promoting the book since May, uh, I've I'm constantly, they're constantly alive in my head. And sometimes I do have little arguments with them. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, why did you say this? Why did you, uh, that was a silly thing you did. Uh, but when it's all my fault, anyway, I, I made them, <laughs> I made them act that way. It, it's quite interesting. They, they're, they're around me. I can sense them. Uh, when I'm doing readings, when I'm chatting to you now, I'm, I'm aware of Leslie hovering around, uh, looking disapprovingly at me. <laughs> What does so she not approve of? Ah, <laughs> uh, that that I wrote her to be so hard and brittle, and, mm. and she she doesn't like that. Uh, but she has to be, I think, to to be having lived in in her marriage and her circumstances. I think she's quite hard. Uh, circumstances made her to be tough. So. It's so interesting to hear they almost live independently of your imagination, yes. or yes. maybe it's your imagination conjuring them. But so fascinating. <laughs> what are the guiding principles of writing for you when you're in that flow? Uh, I have to be, I have to push myself to elevate the language that I use. I have to improve as a writer to be better than the first, the previous book. Uh, and each book has to be, I have to be a better writer than what I was when I was writing the previous book. That's the, 
that's the drive you know it's otherwise what it, what is the point what is the point of being in this long term career if i don't improve if i don't evolve my style if i don't evolve as a person as well so that uh, the, the books are signposts of the my progression through life and hopefully some sort of maturity as well mm -hmm. Or immaturity. They are the signposts of my immaturity more than my maturity. <laughs> <laughs> you're so hard on yourself. And you sound like a perfectionist. Would you say you're a perfectionist? I, I am. Yes, I am. That's one of the reasons why the books take so long to write, because uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm never satisfied. Um, even now when I'm doing public readings you know, mm -hmm. in, in Kunikunia or something, if I'm reading something, a section and then I feel that oh this can be improved and I will change it while I'm reading it so that it's not exactly a hundred percent of what I'm reading on the page wow uh, not, not the entire thing a word here a sentence structure there just just to make it look nicer sound nicer be better so that's it wow. incredible drive <laughs> incredible <laughs> whose writing have you always admired oh so many uh Ishiguru was one uh particularly his early books uh Artists of the Floating World, Remains of the Day. Uh, I love Julian Barnes's very elegant sentences. They're so elegant. And you, you, he drags you along on this really elegant drive. And then there's always a sting at the end. And you suddenly get a slap out of uh, I love that, that that sense of suppressed uh, uh, violence in his, in his sentences. Um, Penelope Lively, uh, if you've read Moon Tiger, if you haven't, please, please read Moon Tiger. It, it's a wonderful, wonderful novel. Um, the last scene where she describes the character, the character is already in the nursing home and she's dying, but the last scene is a dying scene, but she doesn't describe it. She just describes something depleting from the room, a sense of spirit. I don't know how she does it, but suddenly you suddenly realize that um, a, a life has left that, that, that room and it's gone. And yet life also is still going on. So it, it's a masterful uh, uh, writing, that, that section there, the last bit there. Not that the rest of the book isn't great, the rest of the book is great as well, but yeah, that last paragraph is, is incredibly powerful. Very understated, extremely mm, understated. Yes. Mm, that's yes. what some readers that I've spoken to, that's how they describe your work as well, by the way, uh, gentle. Yeah. I gentle. think the more understated you are, the more uh, effective and powerful Mm. Um, you know, because you let the reader's imaginations do most of the the, the heavy work, uh, and and they have more freedom to uh, uh, put in their imagination and their their their, their viewpoints in, in 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 the words that you created. Instead of rather pushing it down or down their throats, you let them just uh, do it themselves. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I could talk about so much more. I have about a zillion yeah. more questions, but I, I, I'm very respectful of your it's time, of course. What, <laughs> what would you like readers to know about the House of Doors? I'd like to, them to know that... Uh, well, I'd, I think I'd like them to know that it, it's not a love story as such. It's actually, it's actually anti-romance, I think, in many ways and anti anti marriage as well in in many ways but i would really like them to go on and read the letter after they finish the house of doors because those two um, the letter by somerset Maugham is a short mm -hmm. story those two are connected in a lot of ways i've used uh, the house of doors is actually the origin story of how somerset Maugham came to write the letter uh, my idea of the origin story so they are interlinked and how you read the letter after you've read the House of Doors, it will affect how you read both. It, it goes back and forth. You know. um, because of what you've read in the House of Doors, it will, it will change your perception of, of what happened in the letter. And because it changes the perception in the letter, you sort of think back to the to House of Doors and say, hang on, you know, it's, it's, is that what really happened? Or is this how this affected this? Or which one, which one came first? You know, that's, that's the feeling I want the readers to, to, to get when they read both works. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not receiving any royalties from the Somerset Maugham estate for, <laughs> for promoting their work, for asking people to go and buy his, his books. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it's beautiful the way your work will inform the way we read literature. 
Yes, I hope so. Yeah, I think yeah. I think every book you read change. Not just not not only the House of Dwarves and the letter, but every single piece of book you read will change how you read the subsequent book. And that's you a wonderful thing. Yeah. Yes, and that's a wonderful thing about reading. You know, it changes you constantly. Uh, even though you don't know it, but the, your your brain circuits are slightly altered every time you read and every time you finish a book. I'm sure of it. You get the circuits gets re rewired. Yep. Uh, um, and it changes you. And then because of that, you approach the next book differently than if you had not read that book before that, whatever mm. book that was. You know, it, it's quite interesting how each book changes you and change it the change is never ending. It just keeps going on. And it's wonderful. Uh, it's, it's, I find it very yeah. exciting. It idea. is. It is. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I've known some writers who say they've come to reading late in life, uh, a lot of men. And have yeah. you always been a reader? Oh, yes, from, from a very young age. And I think uh, uh, my parents were the only parents in the world who despaired that I pick up the uh, reading habit because I would take the books to primary school, you know, start in primary school. I'd be reading under the desk when the teacher was teaching in front. So consequently, I failed all my subjects, all every term, except for English. For some, you know, English was 100% pass. But you know, our report card was always in red if you fail. <laughs> so every term was red, 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 except for English was just the normal blue. So that went all the way up to high school. And I, I started off uh, in in A class, which was supposed to be the you know, standard one. And every year I just fell behind, and I got to the worst class eventually. You know, E. You know. <laughs> 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 just... Who would have it quite, guessed? It was quite funny. I think my parents were like, "Oh no, why did we make him read?" <laughs> ah! And how did they feel when you gave up lawyering for writing? I think they were horrified. Uh, <laughs> they were horrified. They were quite concerned and horrified. But I told them, look, uh, I've already done my five years as a lawyer um, uh, as you had wanted. You know, I did, I put in my time. Um, I feel my obligation to you in that aspect is over. Uh, I've got my own life to lead and I'm, I'm going to try. And uh, I do promise you that I'm not going to come to you for loans, asking you for loans for money. I won't do that. I'll just try and do it on my own. And I, um, yeah, <laughs> but they were they they weren't they were only reassured when uh, the gift of rain was long listed for the Booker Prize. Ah, okay. Then they felt that okay, he's not wasting his time. And he's his going life. somewhere. This yes, guy's going somewhere. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got some uh, read wannabe writers listening in, anxious to hear your advice for them. Okay, sure. Uh, what would you say to them? Oh, okay. My advice is uh, don't be a writer. <laughs> it's a hard, it's a hard, hard, hard profession. I mean, yesterday at a bookie event I did in Kuala Lumpur, uh, a, a member of the audience uh, informed me that one of her friends uh, had written a manuscript and then got rejected. Mm -hmm. And he was so crushed that he didn't think he was going to continue as a writer. And I told the audience member, look, if he is so delicate, then he's not going to achieve anything at all, not just being a writer, because every job, every profession is hard, it's tough. And if you're going to get let that one setback discourage you uh, from doing whatever you want to do, uh, not just being a writer, but being a lawyer or being a teacher, but what, how are you going to um, succeed? You, know, it, it's, you really have to have this toughness in you to keep pushing and pushing and and to you have to improve as well of course there's a reason why he was his manuscript was rejected i'm sure but so you have to learn from uh, the mistakes or the shortcomings and try to 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 improve and that's the same with writing as with as with any profession at all you really have to it's very competitive out there so it you can't just float in and have this idea that oh i i want to be a writer mm -hmm. and then you hope that everything falls into place I, it doesn't it's so competitive out there yeah. wow yeah. wow well thank you for the uh wake up call this morning on writing and thank you for the incredible worlds that you have created for us readers tuan Ng. i wish you all the best uh, thank you michelle for, so yeah. so great to chat to you again <laughs> Until next time, literary supernova Tan Tuan Ng talking about his nomination for the Booker Prize and his latest work, The House of Doors. Speaking to me, Michelle Martin. Tuan Ng, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.
You're with your money. Weekday. That was so great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. No, I, I really appreciate that you you wanted me back on your show again. It's it's, it's just great. It's a great.